afternoon, everyone. This is Mallory Wood, Director of Marketing at M. Stoner, and I am really excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Social Campaigns in Higher Ed. Now, for some of you, you are coming back to this webinar after a few technical difficulties last week, and some others are just joining us for the first time. So no matter which camp you fall in, we're really happy that you're here with us today. Um, and of course, we've got a few housekeeping items, but then we're going to dive right in because we have a lot of really great content to share with you. So first, let's do a quick audio check to make sure that you can actually hear me. And I'm going to exit out of the slideshow for just a moment. Please use the raise your hand feature if you can hear me, just so I can, uh, there we go. Carol, thank you so much. And Diana and Helen, thank you. So it sounds like you can hear me just fine. And that's really wonderful and, and those of you who've sent me comments I appreciate that too all right let's get this back up and running perfect so during the webinar today you can use the chat features or the questions feature to ask questions and we save time at the end for Q&A we'll definitely get to every single question that is asked before signing off so that means we may run a little past the top of the hour if you need to leave that fine we are recording this session today so you will have access to that early next week um, we are also accepting questions through Twitter and our hashtag today is hashtag mstonernow. So I hope you'll join us in the back channel uh, interacting with us tweeting while the presentation's going on, um, but also send us your questions. Once again, that hashtag is mstonernow. And as I mentioned, we will be recording this webinar. Um, we will make that available on our YouTube channel and on the M Stoner blog uh, in a few weeks. But because you're registered and you're attending this session, we're actually going to give you early access to that recording. So watch your email probably Monday morning for a link to both the slides and the recorded session from today. One more exciting announcement is that we have a surprise giveaway after today's webinar. So we're going to be sending one lucky person a copy of M. Stoner's book, Social Works. There are 25 case studies in this book that demonstrate that social media has the maturity and reach to be an integral component of campaigns focused on building awareness, recruiting students, engaging alumni, and raising money. So you're probably saying, well, how do I enter this giveaway? All you have to do is fill out the exit survey after you log out of the webinar. Webinar. Make sure your pop-up blocker is off. It'll magically appear when you sign out, and a winner will be selected at random uh, from those folks who filled out the uh, post-exit survey last week and from this week, and we'll announce that winner when we email out the recording on Monday. So let's get right to it um, and, and introduce today's presenters. As I mentioned, I'm Mallory Wood, Director of Marketing at M. Stoner. So my role at M. Stoner is to manage all of our marketing and business development activities. So if there's a project that you'd like to work with us on, I would be your point of contact. Prior to M. Stoner, I worked for St. Michael's College and was the social media strategist from the marketing office and also have some experience working in their admissions office. Daniela, take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us or rejoining us. I'm Daniela Norton, the Online Community Manager at Skidmore College in lovely upstate Saratoga Springs. I've been here about three years, and I am housed in the Communications Office. So thanks for joining us. Perfect. <laughs> and Ashley, hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Budd, and I am Assistant Director of Social Media Strategy at Cornell University, and I am housed in alumni relations um, within alumni affairs and development at Cornell. All right, and we'll be bringing those two back on in just a little bit. They'll tell us a little bit more about their roles. Um, but let's get right to it. Uh, nearly every college and university in America and beyond uses social media in student recruitment, alumni relations, institutional marketing, or fundraising. Or for many institutions, they're using social media for all of those things. Many institutions are also combining social channels with other online and offline channels to create integrated and multidimensional campaigns. And this webinar is going to highlight two such campaigns. First, we'll focus on how a small liberal arts college used social media to engage with alumni and current students. And then we will talk to Ashley about how a large Ivy League institution used 
social media, and crowdfunding to raise money. So by the end of this webinar, I hope you'll have proof that social works and social campaigns are a meaningful avenue for communicating with your audiences. In the words of Michael Stoner, not every campaign needs a detailed plan, but every campaign needs a plan. And so if you're tweeting, I hope you will tweet that with the hashtag mstonernow. Uh, developing a plan forces you to think about the fundamentals and many different aspects of what goes into a campaign. So let's look at some of those key components. And we're going to go into a little more depth about a few of these, but, but really these are the key components of any campaign. You need to have your goals and objective, objectives, identify your audiences, which channels, tools, and other assets you will use, uh, who on your staff is going to participate, are you going to ask others to help and participate in the campaign, what type of marketing and promotion will you do, what's your timeline, what's your budget, and of course at the end and throughout you want to be measuring. So let's talk about a few of these in a little more depth. Um, I've been known to say over and over and over again, uh, goals before tools. And no campaign should start without a clear set of goals. What is it that you actually want to accomplish? Who are you trying to reach? How will the campaign support your institution's strategic goals? And answers to these questions are going to influence all of the rest of the decisions that you make during your campaign planning. So in my opinion, it is extremely important that you identify your goals up front. I particularly like the SMART goals framework. So the SMART goals that you're seeing on your screen stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And I have to share that last week on our webinar, we actually have one of our participants tweet out uh, a sticky note that she had on her wall that actually said, you know, the SMART goals in order, and I loved it. And so a little shout out to Megan for doing that last week, because that was really awesome. So let's skip down uh, to the marketing and promotion parts of campaign planning. In general, um, it's important to market your campaign across many different mediums. So while you may primarily be using Facebook in the campaign, that doesn't mean that Twitter can't help you drive traffic. And it's important to determine who you're trying to influence in order to figure out the best ways to reach them. So blending online and offline channels is often an important step in uh, any social media campaign. And getting support from engaged participants can be a really great way to spread the campaign by word of mouth. And finally, let's talk about measurement. So how are you going to measure your results at the end uh, or even during the campaign? You know, how are you going to know you've reached your goals? And, and this goes back to those SMART goals that you've set. So if it's possible, try and benchmark. Um, sometimes that means benchmarking against the successes of previous years, and other times that means making an educated guess based on past engagement. But focusing on meaningful goals like in, that we have up here on the screen that tie back to your institution's core challenges of recruitment, retention, fundraising, and alumni engagement are going to be a real measure of a campaign's success versus just focusing on how many new Twitter followers you might receive, for example. And so to wrap up my intro, if you're tweeting, I hope you'll also tweet this. It's not about us, it's about the audience we want to reach. Uh, this is something that Susan Evans, one of the strategists that M. Stoner shared on an M. Stoner webinar last year, and I have to agree that this is one of the ultimate truths of communication. We need to think like our audiences, and it's important whether or not you're doing marketing, recruitment, fundraising, or communications, and this works for every single platform that you're going to use in a social media campaign. So focusing on the audience has never been more important or more challenging as all of those platforms and mediums for our messages change. So let's look at two case studies. We're going to dive right into the first one. Um, we're going to bring Daniela back for Skids on the Loose. Daniela, hello. Please tell us a little bit more about your role at Skidmore. 
Sure. So um, as I mentioned before, I'm the online community manager here. I'll give you a little bit of background about Skidmore since Mallory sort of touched on that. We are a small liberal arts school, about 2,400 undergrads with a very tiny master's program. Um, and we are mostly, we were an all-women's school before, an all-women's finishing school, and we went co-ed in the 70s. So we um, haven't been around, been around for about 100 years, but a lot of our alumni are female and and a lot of the um, national trending, as you all know, um, the 60-40 um, male-female ratio that we get to give you a little bit of background on our student body and our alumni there. So as an online community manager, I would like to say that I have the coolest job on campus. I'm in charge of the social media strategy for the entire college. Everything from academics to admissions to advancement, student affairs. I help offices and departments determine their social media strategy, where they should be, when they should be. Um, there, I'm the primary producer of content for the college main sites, um, main social sites, and then I get to have a lot of fun with campaigns like Skids on the Loose and College Colors Days, College Colors Day, and a lot of other fun social campaigns. Awesome. So. How exactly did you come up with the idea for the Skids on the Loose campaign? <laughs> so um, I guess it all started a few years ago. We did a really in-depth survey with our alumni to get some ideas about how they felt about their relationship to the college. We found out in this might be surprising to some of you, um, and it might not, that alumni felt we were reaching out to them too often with solicitations, regardless of whether or not we were actually doing that. That was how they felt, and that was their perception. So they also told us that they felt they had no connection to our current students, our prospective students, or events going on on campus. So we decided we were going to look for ways to engage our current students and our alumni, and then sort of in the back of our minds, um, third tier, um, our prospects and prospective students and families. We thought that the easiest way to do this would be to do um, a campaign during the six-week winter break, a time when we don't usually reach out to our alumni and current students. And the idea really came from Flat Stanley. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Flat Stanley, but he's a children's book. Um, his father gives him and his brother a, a big bulletin board to display pictures and posters. But one night, the board falls on Stanley flattening him. The advantage that Stanley has now that he is flat is that he can, he's flat enough to be mailed in an envelope and sent around to his friends. So I think in the early 90s, a teacher in Canada created the Flat Stanley Project to facilitate letter writing by giving his students Flat Stanleys to mail all over the world asking for responses. My original idea was to create Flat Phil, who is the president of Skidmore College, but that didn't really go anywhere, <laughs> as you can imagine. So we modified Flat Stanley to focus on Skidmore's athletic mascot, um, whose name is Skids Scribner, and he's a thoroughbred who has a lot of personality. So we decided that um, sharing photos is probably the easiest way to reach our audience and the easiest way to engage our audience. A lot of people have smartphones and they share pictures on social media and people could always email their images, which we'll kind of get into the logistics a little bit later. But we built the campaign as a photo challenge so that we could send, instead of letter writing for Flat Stanley, they could send pictures of skids on the loose around the world. Awesome. So I just got uh, you know, a little bit of, I just gave a little bit of information to our webinar attendees around goal setting, so we would be remiss if we didn't start there, right? <laughs> Before <laughs> yep. we get into the specifics, what were some of the goals of your campaign? Sure. I think the, the big goal for us um, was engaging our alumni and current students. Um, we, uh, you can, I was going to say, yeah, I think there's a picture of, um, of skids enjoying some beignets at Café du Monde in New Orleans. Um, we were just looking to be salient in their minds wherever they went, especially on their travels during winter break. We were also um, thinking about getting the brand out there. So you'll see that in the in the picture, Skids has a t-shirt on that says Skidmore on it. It's something very simple, a way to kind of get the Skidmore name out there and getting these user-generated uh, images from our audience was a good and easy way of getting the Skidmore name out there. There's Skids on the desk of one of our alumni um, councilwomen. Um, we also 
we thought tertiarily about um, getting contact info and updating our contact info from our alumni. We were looking for ways to reach alumni who might be missing from our database or who maybe didn't feel like they could give but wanted to engage in the college in some other way. Um, so we asked people to sign up to request a SCIBS so we could update their confirmation that way or we could get new people that way. And then we were thinking about prospective students and their families and acceptance letters. So we wanted to drum up some action around what's usually a slow time for us. Um, and I think, yes, we've got a little infographic here. We did a case study of the electronic communications that we send out. And you can see there's a big hole. Well, not a big hole. Not as big as in July and August, but that's another project. But in between January and December, there weren't a whole lot of email communications going out. But our perspective, our early decision students had just gotten their letters. Um, their acceptance letters, they're looking for ways to communicate and engage with us and what information could we put out there if the, they were already paying attention. So that was one of the reasons we decided to go around that six week time period. I absolutely love this vision <laughs> of your electronic communications and I know it was a big hit on the webinar last week and I've, I've actually just taken a photo and I'm going to cheat it out because <laughs> this is such a beautiful way and such an easy way to digest who you're communicating with. So beyond the relevance of this campaign, I imagine our attendees are going to take away, you know, <laughs> thinking about communications in a different way because this is really nice. Well, right, and it so was so helpful. It's really helpful to see oh everything goodness. like that. It's a good, it's a good audit for people to do. <laughs> oh, I, I imagine that's absolutely the case. So okay. <laughs> uh, we'll leave the tangent. We'll get back on, it's on the loose. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about what your planning process looks like. Sure. So the first step was to actually acquire some Skids dolls. So we worked with our campus bookstore, um, and they had six-inch stuffed horses already wearing Skidmore t-shirts. Some of them had bow ties, too. They were fancy Skids. Um, so we secured 400 of those. We advertised the photo challenge on all of our social networks, the web page, and via email. Um, first, we only did one to students and one to alumni to create some exclusivity um, around that. And then we pushed alumni and current students to go online and sign up to receive their skids. Since it was a photo challenge, we came up with some categories for submission and judging. So um, it made it easier to participants to kind of give them some ideas to take photos. We were pretty deliberate in choosing our categories so that they aligned with Skidmore's strategic goals and marketing messages. And we were, I think we'll get into that a little bit later. And then finally, we created and promoted the hashtag Skids on the Loose, um, as well as hashtags for each of the individual categories so that people could submit very easily that way. I just think it was so smart of you and your team to have those hashtags for the individual categories. I think it would have been easy to just come up with a bunch of fun things, but to actually tie them back to the strategic goals and the marketing messages of Skidmore, I think adds a level of sophistication to this campaign that some others that I've seen I think just don't have. So. Um, we've got the categories up on the screen. Why don't you talk through them and kind of share which ones were most popular? Sure. So, um, so these are our categories. I think a, a no-brainer um, for key strategies and messages for a lot of colleges, the career development angle. So one of our categories was Skids at Work. And you can see him, I think we've got a shot of him following around an alumni in forensics, which is really cool. So people could submit photos of him at the desk or in the field, whatever they were doing. We wanted to showcase our alumni at work. Um, CPM Skids is, uh, is very, our marketing message here at Skidmore is Creative Thought Matters, which a lot of the students and alumni shorten to CPM. And this is sort of our anything goes category. So you can see Skids hanging out on someone's pet dog there. I think this is Mallory's favorite, favorite photo is. submission. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so that, go, that went back to our marketing message. We also, um, our president talks a lot about creating global citizens at Skidmore and um, what it means to be a global citizen. So we created a sightseeing Skids category. And here's this year's Skids visiting the Taj Mahal, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so we kind of got that message out that way. We um, also always want to support school spirit and athletics. So we had a Skids spirit 
category where he went to hockey games and hung out with Skidmore gear, um, your basic school spirit stuff. And then we did have some fun categories. Photobombing was big in 2012, so we thought maybe Skids could photobomb a few folks. Um, here's one of him photobombing somebody in Chicago. Um, and then we had a Skids to the Extreme category for sort of our extreme um, mountaineers out there, you know, I think the one picture we have is him on top of a mountain, we've got skiers, we've got all sorts of, um, you know, he was at the Red Sea, I think, he's been, he's been all over the world. Our most popular categories for the first year, so this will be, this was our second year we just finished up. The first year was CTM skids and he had 130, uh, in that category had 133 submissions and then sightseeing skids had 240 submissions. This year sightseeing and CTM were the most popular categories and CTM had 119 submissions and sightseeing had about 160. So pretty popular categories there. That's great. Yeah. Try saying sightseeing. I know. Skids like seven <laughs> times in a row, right? Oh, look, and there's, I'm sorry. I oh, yeah, there he is. Oh, that's another okay. sightseeing skid right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love it. <laughs> so let's talk about how participants actually went about submitting their photos because there's definitely some tactical issues here that you probably had to overcome. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we tried to make it as easy as possible, keep it simple um, for everybody. We were asking all our alumni to participate, and even though this was envisioned as a social campaign, we were still really aware of the fact that maybe some of our older alumni didn't have social accounts or possibly had never heard of Twitter. Um, so we asked participants to upload their photos on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. The only requirement was that they use the appropriate hashtag, Skins on the Loose, and then to kind of hit the lowest common denominator, we also told alumni that they could email us the photo directly. Um, I think that was kind of important on our end. We really wanted the participation and the engagement numbers to be high. So we were willing on the back end to do a little bit more legwork matching up the social submissions to the names of the people who signed up to get a skids at the beginning of the campaign so that we didn't have to reach out to them on social media and ask them for their name or, or follow up. We just wanted them to be able to tweet a picture using that hashtag and we would, kind of, we would take care of the dirty work on the back end. Mm -hmm. So how did you actually communicate with people during that six week period that they could participate and that how frequently did you choose to communicate? Yeah, um, most of our, actually, primarily we used social media um, or our website. Our main Skidmore social accounts communicated primarily over Facebook and Twitter. We retweeted submissions as they came in. Um, this past year, you know, with Facebook rolling out hashtags, that was a lot easier to maintain that way. We used Tagboard, which is what you guys are looking at now in the webinar. Um, it's a free social aggregator to curate the submissions and keep track of them as they came in, and then instead of emailing and confirming um, all the submissions as they came in. We confirmed submissions by liking, favoriting, retweeting um, on the appropriate channel. That way people knew we received them and they didn't have to, we didn't have to follow up that way, which was an, a much easier way of doing it. Awesome. So I've got the results up on the screen. Let's, let's talk about these. Um, you've done this campaign twice. Why don't you walk us through the results for your one? Sure. Sure. So um, year one, we received uh, more than 500 photo submissions, which was great. We got rid or we sent out um, 383 Skids dolls out of the 400 that we bought. He traveled to six continents, 52 countries, and 38 States. We plotted all the points for the requests and all the photo submissions on a Google map and then embedded that onto the web page, which was pretty cool. And then we received a total of 1,360 votes for each of those six categories. Um, a little bit of, of about the difference between year one and year two. In year one, voting was done entirely on Facebook. Um, we had some concerns. We think that our current students might not have felt comfortable liking or voting on Facebook. Some alums weren't on Facebook, um, so we heard back from them. But we were happy to see that our numbers grew for our Facebook fans during the voting period. So we were hitting some folks that weren't paying attention before. And in the first year, the winner for each category was chosen 
based solely on the number of Facebook likes. So voting was a Facebook like. And then winners received just a small swag prize, water bottle or a sweatshirt or something. It, it wasn't really about the prize. It was more about participating that year. Um, in the second year, we gave out less Skids dolls, um, but we did, they were different. They were wearing a white shirt instead of a green shirt, but we still, we still accepted submissions from the year one Skids dolls. So we sent out 153. We got more than 200 photos, and we, we revised it a bit. We eliminated one of the categories that didn't do so well. Photo bombing Skids only got about four submissions, so we decided to get rid of that one. Um, another big change that we made this year was voting was done using a software called Wishpond. Um, and this is great because we were able to take advantage of their free trial. Our voting period was only two weeks. And we could embed it on our web page. People could vote with their email address. Um, it made everyone's life easier. The students who didn't feel comfortable voting on Facebook, the alumni who didn't have Facebook accounts, could go directly to Skidmore's page. We got about 987 votes year two, and then we took the overall category winners, posted them on our Facebook page, asked our fans to vote for the overall winner, which secured about another 100 votes. And then we took that overall winner picture and put that up as our Facebook cover photo for the week for the college page. So pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so we're looking at um, all these quantifiable results, but I'm sure that there were some unexpected results, some unquantifiable things that uh, came out of this campaign. Oh, yes. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're sort of pleasantly surprised that people know Skids and sort of ask for him and look for him year-round now. Um, a lot of folks are taking pictures of him, um, you know, and, and sending them to us, you know, on a, when babies are born or with their pets or when they're hanging out with other Skid kids. You know, it doesn't just happen in this six-week time period. Um, our admissions team, for example, when they travel abroad um, are out there recruiting and and taking pictures with prospective students in the Skids doll, which is really cool. Um, I think the other maybe unquantifiable result was it was surprising to see which photos resonated with people. Um, I mean, you saw the picture of, of Skids on the dog. Uh, pets are just like a huge um, category uh, unto themselves. But we have one little alum who has a pug who has back wheels on a wheelchair. And this picture got something like 50, 60 some likes. And I think that really speaks to the power of social networks. I think that alumni put that picture up, asked all of his friends to vote for it. And then that brings in the votes and the shares. And that gets your message out too. So that's a little bit more unquantifiable and unexpected than, than we thought it would be, mm -hmm. but was still kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So I've got a couple questions from some of our participants. Um, a sure. couple of people are asking if you wouldn't mind sharing how much the cost was for the, the dolls. Oh so. my gosh, that is a really good question that I should have had and I don't. Can I tweet that out later? Um, I think because so. I am not positive how much our Skid Dolls cost. I know that working with our bookstore, um, gave, they gave us a little bit of a discount, um, but I will, I will double check that. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry. That great. And they're saying thank you. So wonderful. That sounds like <laughs> that sounds like that'll work. And so, um, backtracking a little bit, uh, how did you inform non-social media using individuals um, about their image showing up on Instagram or Twitter? So we said straight up in um, the emails and on the web page that if you um, submit a picture that we will share it at Skidmore College um, on the social accounts. So, um, and, and surprisingly we did not hear back from anybody after we had shared the photos or posted them on the web page that they were unhappy with that. So we got lucky mm -hmm. in that case, but we did put that up in, on the rules page of our site. You know, mm -hmm. if you submit a photo, then it's open to, for us to share it and that we own it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, and do you have an idea of the number uh, or percentage of photos that you had to load up on social networks <laughs> after receiving a physical photo? Um, you know, that's a good question. I would say maybe about 25%. It was higher than I was expecting because I, I thought all of them would come in for social, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't an unmanageable amount. So I would say a quarter of our photos we probably spent time mm -hmm. curating, saving to, you know, our shared server, putting them back up. 
so not mm-hmm. too many. Yeah. And last question for now, Helen's wondering um, if you could just repeat of how you gave people prizes or if there even were prizes. Yes, yes, there were prizes, um, and we did just small swag prizes, tote bags, water bottles, sweatshirts, that type of thing, and each of the um, the the category winners, so depending on how many votes um, your photo in each category got on Facebook, that was a vote that was a like, so whichever photo had the most likes was declared the winner in the first year, and then we reached out to them and said, congratulations, your photo won, and we're sending you this prize. So, um, and then the same thing for the second year, um, all of the categories you would vote on the page, we would determine, tally up the votes, and Wishpond did all of that for us the second year, which was great, so we didn't have two people going in and on Facebook and trying to figure out which picture had the most votes. We could just download the results, which was nice, mm-hmm. um, on Wishpond and reached out to them that way. So Good in question. summary, yeah, what are some of the lessons that you've learned now experiencing this twice? Um, so many lessons. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I think you know I'm su- I was surprised at how much people wanted to wanted to participate and wanted to be engaged. This was our first organized attempt at a social campaign that didn't ask for money, and I just felt like it was long overdue. Um, I think this was also a really great shared experience for the community. I went to Ohio State as an undergrad, and we have the football as sort of our shared experience. But at a place like Skidmore, where it's small liberal arts and only 2,400 kids, and you know where creative of thought matters, you know, you're you're all over the place. Athletics isn't that shared experience everyone has. Some people are art majors, some people do play sports and you know, I think that this was a good way to bring to bridge the communities together. Um, and it also helped that Skids was our sports mascot and that he's recognizable by anybody. You can't miss, you know, a big horse dressed up on campus. So people <laughs> got excited got excited about that. Um, I think the other lessons we learned is that these campaigns have to constantly evolve um, and that we, we're getting better at managing them and making it easier to manage. So I talked a little bit about the Facebook voting. That was one thing that we changed. Removing the category that didn't do well, you know, was also another thing that changed. Maybe we'll remove another next uh, a next year. Maybe we'll create another. I think on the last webinar I talked about creating a, a skid selfie category because selfie was the word of 2013. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think we'd like to see more current student involvement. Um, We talked about putting a table, handing out skids at a tabling, like in the dining hall or something, so that we could pick up some stragglers. Um, And then, you know, talking about the time, um, the timeline for it. Six weeks is a long time, um, you know, but could we do it year-round because people are sort of submitting it? Do we have a special category for the year-round? So all of those are lessons that we learned, and all of that stuff is changing. (laughs) Sure. And what are some of the ways that you're taking advantage of this user-generated content outside of the campaign? Yeah, so we use um, a lot of the photo submissions and emails to alumni and prospective students. Um, the winner, like I said before, became our Skid- became Skidmore's Facebook page's cover photo. We continue to share the images through social media during the year, especially when we get it. Um, we've set up a photo gallery on the pages so people can view those. And we share in our alumni magazine, um, you know, all all sorts of of different ideas, but it's something that we're still kind of exploring and thinking about too. And actually, to answer the Skids question, I just heard back from my colleague, who is wonderful, um, at next door. I shot her an email. So, so she says that um, the Skids dolls cost about twenty-one hundred dollars in year one, and then two hundred dollars for printing, which was mailing the labels, seventy-five dollars for boxes for shipping. So the total for the whole project was about $2,375. So sorry to jump around there, but I just got the answer. No problem. (laughs) Way to multitask. I like it. Yes. Good question. Well, we we do have some questions. I'm I'm going to save them until the end. A few more people have sent them in. Um, So we're going to switch gears, Daniela. Thank you so much for sharing your case study. We'll bring you back at the end to answer a few more questions. Um, but I do have to say one tweet that just came through that I really liked. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. Sky Lopez said, uh, you guys should take skids to graduation, have graduates take photos with 
in and their diploma. And I, I love that. Love idea. that. Yeah, love right. that. It's, awesome. it's done next year for sure, Skyla. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's Sheila. Just <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sheila. Thank you for the correction. I knew I was going to butcher that. All right, so let's bring Ashley back on and. Um, Again, Daniela, thank you so much. Let's switch gears. Let's talk about Cornell and their crowdfunding campaign. And Ashley, can you start by telling us a little bit more about your role at Cornell? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think I sit in a unique role with um, a, a pretty large team, so I'm happy to talk about what that looks like. Um, I am one of three full-time social media folks. Um, we are, call ourselves strategists, but um, one of three full-time positions dedicated to social media within Cornell's Division of Alumni Affairs and Development. And I recognize that it is exceptional to have this amount of resources dedicated to social media within one area, but I found um, that with these resources, we've been able to move beyond community management, which is a full-time job in itself, to allow Cornell to pilot several business and strategies in the digital space. And I'm getting a little bit of an echo, so I'm going to boot myself <laughs> and keep talking. <laughs> so uh, in my portfolio within my team, I support digital media, live streaming, and video editing. Um, I also do web content strategy and crowdfunding, um, and I work with a crowdfunding coaching program um, that I'll talk a little bit about today, um, but I think crowdfunding was one of these projects that we took on that kind of helped us uh, define what the social media team was doing outside of um, what a lot of folks in our division would normally categorize as social media. All right, yeah, what people don't know who are on this webinar is that Ashley and I are actually located in the same house right now. So if there was any echo, we're so sorry about that, but it should be fine. And please tweet us to let us know if um, you can hear Ashley loud and clear and, and that the audio is coming in well. Um, all right, so. Thanks for giving us the background, Ashley. I think it makes sense to start out by defining for the audience what crowdfunding is and how it fits with social. Sure. Um, crowdfunding is nothing too new, um, but it is something that is um, on a lot of advancement shops' minds right now. It's essentially fundraising from a crowd or a group of people online. And um, with crowdfunding projects, there's typically a specific project that the funds are being raised for, and a time limit is given to be able to give to the project. Most crowdfunding campaigns run for 30 to 45 days. And so my team recognized that our job was not just to support alumni engagement, online, but also to support fundraising, um, being that we are situated within alumni affairs and development. Um, and so we looked specifically at annual giving. Our team was positioned nicely to take on a pilot project for the division because we already worked in the digital space and had already developed large online communities that we can leverage. And um, we're also looking at the social engagement metrics um, that are rarely as concrete as real dollar signs. So working with crowdfunding was an added bonus for us because we knew if we could make this pilot work, we could relate more, more directly to the bottom line and emphasize the value of our large team that we had. So why in general should higher ed consider crowdfunding? Well, I think we were looking at the growth of the crowdfunding market at the beginning of 2012. Um, and at that time, the market was projected to be a $4 billion market in 2013 with exponential growth 
for years out. Um, some claim it's going to be a $93 billion market by 2025. I've seen upwards of $300 billion projected. So we were looking at these trends, and with that in mind, we decided to do a test with our market to see if crowdfunding um, a venture like this would work for Cornell, and more importantly, if it could work for Cornell Alumni Affairs and Development. So um, I think um, we saw some good examples of other institutions testing out crowdfunding and um, seeing mixed results with success, um, and we really just wanted to understand whether this growing market where our constituents would likely be giving money to other projects um, because of the trend, um, if, if this is a place that we could position ourselves um, to give an opportunity to our constituents to give to us um, and to see if that kind of giving would be in line with the goals that we set for the institution. Awesome, and thank you for bringing up goals. Just like uh, we started the webinar and started Daniela's section of this webinar with um, goal setting, why don't you share some of the specific goals around uh, the crowdfunding campaigns that you led? I'm happy to. Um, we took a really scientific approach to the pilot, um, and so we formed three hypotheses that we felt pretty comfortable with that we shared with our division, and we expected that crowdfunding would activate new donors. We also expected that it would reactivate last donors who maybe had given but haven't given, didn't give the year before or a couple of years last. And then we also um, suspected that crowdfunding would engage young alumni. So those are the metrics that we were gonna measure the success of the pilot against. Awesome. So I know you didn't want to uh, compete with your annual fund here. Why don't you talk us through right, this slide? Right, right, right. Yeah, um, so I, you know, I mentioned those were the, those three hypotheses were things that we were comfortable with sharing with other folks in our division um, when they asked us what we were up to. Um, but there were a few things that we were keeping in mind. Um, and one was that we didn't want to compete with our annual fund. Um, and with the solicitations that they would be making throughout the year since they're also after small gifts. Um, all of our crowdfunding was counted towards annual giving, so um, we made sure to position ourselves with annual fund in that way, um, that we were um, working with them towards an annual giving participation goal. Um, we wanted to heighten the donor experience, um, which was kind of an added bonus to the crowdfunding discovery process for us, um, what we could do to have a better donor experience for people with small gifts and how we could steward them better with small gifts. Um, right now you have to write a, a pretty hefty check to get any um, real exciting stewardship for Cornell. So um, we're kind of curious to see what crowdfunding could do to elevate that experience. And um, we also wanted to engage current students on our campus and alumni who are volunteering to fundraise. Um, and we wanted to do that in a way that made fundraising fun and easy and not a daunting and awkward task of asking money. So we were hoping to kind of change the perception of what it means to be a fundraiser for the university by um, using this crowdfunding model to kind of put a different skin on it and make it a little bit more fun. So let's talk about the planning process. What did that look like? Um, the planning process um, it took quite a while, and um, we had quite a few cooks in our kitchen. Um, this is the way we organized it. We, um, uh, the social media team that I am on led the project, um, but we did bring in a project manager from our um, information technologies and services team within our division. So um, we had one person who was kind of the the, the project manager who kept us on task, um, but I would say that still the vision and the drive for the project came out of social media. Um, and then we invited project leads from around our division. Um, we had a core team that met every week, and that included someone from Annual Fund, um, the senior director for IT, um, 
marketing communications, our metrics and marketing person who does a lot of our alumni surveys, um, prospect research and donor relations also um, made a lot of sense to have at the table when we're talking about um, you know, what kind of complications we could have if a major donor wanted to participate in crowdfunding, um, what the stewardship um, piece should look like um, in a new kind of model like this. So having one representative from each one of those areas on our core team um, was great not only for internal buy-in, but for us to really have all of the right people thinking about how we would do something like this that we've never done before. So um, uh, like I said, we met once a week. We also um, brought in a third-party vendor to supply the, um, the software that we would need. Um, and it was all um, browser-based deployed software, and that was with a company called Useed. All right, so let's walk through the actual campaign itself and the timeline. Mm -hmm. um, the whole process itself from um, the time we had a project idea submitted to the time we had the campaign over and the funds were raised um, was about a 10-week process for each campaign. Um, we did try to compress it for one or two of the campaigns, and sometimes that worked and sometimes that didn't. So I think 10 weeks from start to finish is a really safe timeline to work within. And what we did within that 10-week process um, was um, we had an application online that people on campus had to fill out, and that gave us some of the basic information that we needed for their project, um, but it also gave them um, kind of an introductory look at how they would need to form their fundraising teams, what kind of questions they would need to ask themselves if they wanted to get involved in crowdfunding. Um, so I think that was a really important starting point for us to have that online application. Um, but we also had a lot of conversations with folks online that we thought would be a good fit. Um, we had people within alumni affairs and development that were working on projects that you know, might not have fit for a major gift prospect, um, but could work with a bunch of small gifts for, crowd, for crowdfunding purposes. So we did lean on our own um, networks within the campus for this pilot. Um, we didn't share the application all over campus, um, it, but it was there for people who wanted to kind of sit down and think about what they were going to do. Um, the next step after we received the application was to have an interview with the group. and. Um, we only give the interview to viable applicants, so when we thought the project looked like it would be a good fit for crowdfunding, um, we would ask to speak with um, a campus sponsor that needed to be either a staff member or a faculty member on campus, um, and one or two of their student or alumni leads that would be part of the fundraising project. So um, we got them on a call, and <laughs> during the interview, um, if it looked like it would work, if they set a reasonable goal, if they had a compelling story, they'd get the green light from us um, to move forward. Our smallest goal for the pilot was $5,000, and the largest was $30,000. Um, after we would green light their project, we had an orientation for them set up on the platform, and this is where um, all of the fundraising team members would be given email templates and kind of a demo of what they would be interacting with online. Most of the campaigns were based on email to start. Um, that was really the driving um, motivator behind the whole kickoff of the campaign. Um, and we were really dependent on our fundraisers to be willing to work via email. So we provided them with email templates. Um, but I can talk a little bit more about how we built their networks into um, the campaign. Um, we also were using the UC platform that had an email component built into it. Um, so it wasn't just about throwing up a project on the website and hoping for the best. Um, there really was kind of a detailed communication plan that went right alongside this. So uh, we took a few weeks to coach and orient our folks on the platform and with what the expectations were going to be for email um, before the campaign started. And each campaign ran for four weeks. Uh, there were different communication strategies we used each week. 
Um, we did have a social media strategy that we would deploy um, after the campaign had reached 30%. Um, but just to give you kind of a sense of what we found worked um, was that we had each fundraiser send uh, send emails to 20 different contacts. So we had them build a contact list of 20 of their own first order network peers. And they would do direct personal solicitation to those peers. Uh, and if we could get the campaigns to reach 30%, we knew that they would reach 100%. So what we were looking, really looking for was the first order network to get up to the 30% of the goal. Um, and then the kind of the rest of it kind of worked its own magic um, itself. Um, so I'm happy to go into more detail, but I know we have a short amount of time, um, and I can show you a little bit of what the outcome was with these projects. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't you roll right into results? Okay. Um, so goals were met really quickly on many of the campaigns. Um, we crafted new goal strategies for the remainder of each campaign of each of the campaigns, so you'll see that um, with seven projects, all of them reached their goals and all of them were overfunded. Um, and a lot of times we didn't feel comfortable setting up a new dollar goal. So what we did after the campaigns reached their goal amount was we would set a participation goal to just get more supporters and regardless of the dollar amount. Um, overall, we had uh, 1,302 donors. We raised $114,584. And what I was really impressed with was that, um, you know, I kind of expected with crowdfunding that we would receive a lot of $5 and $10 gifts, um, but the average gift was $88. Um, and then as far as those hypotheses that I referenced earlier, um, we um, absolutely um, hit all of those, those target expectations, 64% um, of the donors were first-time donors to Cornell, 13% were lapsed donors, and 27% were young alumni. And Mallory, if I could ask you just to flip back to the last slide, um, that chart there I think is a little bit more compelling than the 27% um, young alumni statistic because you can really see that the 2000s and the 2010 plus graduates um, really got into this model. Um, we had we had a little. Um, bit of uh, anomaly in the 1980s, <laughs> it messed up our data, um, because we had a really active um, alum fundraiser from the 1980s working on the LGBTQ project. So <laughs> he messed up our data by doing such a good job. Um, but it, certainly crowdfunding um, was a great hit for the young alumni, which has been a real challenge um, for most annual giving um, projects on, at different institutions, so um, we're excited to see that. Um, I mentioned that all of these gifts counted towards annual giving. Um, in addition, we saw 12% of our donors give an additional gift to the annual fund when we prompted them to, so that was a nice bonus to see when we did a little upsell at the end of the campaign. Um, as far as stewardship goes, um, I think that we did succeed in having a heightened experience for small gift donors. And um, I can use one example from the Baja Racing Team. Um, they have been sending out news updates through email uh, with videos and images from the car that they're building for their um, racing team. And so without even giving them ideas about stewardship, um, they kind of just kicked in their own communications plan um, and have been stewarding their donors as if they were team members, which is a lot of fun. Um, we plan on making stewardship a more formalized part of crowdfunding, where we would check in with the teams um, three months out just to make sure that they're, they're still um, going to be using the funds for what they said that they were going to be using them for, that they're getting the funds into their account okay, um, and that they have a plan for telling the story of what they're doing with those funds. Um, and we expect that um, we'll ask them to have some of those stewardship communications six months after the campaign is complete um, because uh, that's usually enough time for them to get the money and then actually get the things <laughs> that they were going to use the money for um, and you know give an update back to the donors. Um, just as kind of a last 
metric that we were looking at um, as far as engaging the, the current students and faculty and staff as volunteers. Um, we were able to engage 192 volunteers through this small pilot. Um, and those were the current students, alumni, and campus partners. Um, I think they had a great time fundraising. Um, we definitely um, changed the attitude from one of awkwardness to one that you can have a little bit more fun with online. Um, so I, you know, I'm really happy with the way it went. If I could give any lessons learned, um, I would say that um, <laughs> it's great to build big fundraising teams around crowdfunding because that just means larger networks that they can reach out to. But 20% of the fundraising teams end up doing 80% of the work. Um, so it's really important to identify a campus sponsor, that faculty or staff member, and a lead student or a lead alumni champion for the project. Um, because those, those in leadership positions tend to take on more responsibility um, and really do a lot of most of the brunt work um, and most of the fundraising and bring in the most dollars. So, the more people you can designate into leadership roles, the better. So Bruce uh, Floyd asked a question over Twitter. How close to the deadline did you reach your goals? In other words, how early did you hit your goals? Um, I would say, and I, I can look, um, I can look at specific campaigns, but I would say the campaigns that were the five ten thousand dollar campaigns, um, those were in the first week <laughs> usually successful. Um, so those came out really quickly. Um, the larger um, project, the $30,000 project, um, which was the other one that um, took a long time. The ones with the larger goals did take a little bit more time, but what we found was that they would hit that 30% mark really quickly. Um, and um, after that, you had a core group of donors um, that had personal, at least one step removed, a personal connection to the project because they were solicited personally for that project. And they were more willing to come on board and be champions for the rest of the fundraising. Um, so I, I said that we were doing a lot of um, email solicitation. Really what it was was a set of five different emails. The first one was a pre-launch email just telling people about the campaign that it was coming up, not asking for anything yet. The second one was that the project had launched and to take a look. If you want to give, that'd be great. If you could share it, that would be great. And then the last three emails were all based on uh, certain milestones. So a 50% milestone, an 80 or 90% milestone, and then the campaign goal email. Um, so it, it really was less about the begging for money and more about the storytelling around the project um, and asking people not just to give, but to share the story. Um, and I think that helps after you hit that 30%, that helps um, you move through the next 70% much quicker and for the network to, to really spread from there. And there's a little bit of conversation on Twitter right now, too, about the average gift size of $88. And mm -hmm. some people are wondering if there were some outliers that skewed that number up or down. Um, did you take a look at that when you crunched that number? Yeah, um, there certainly were. Um, I would say every project, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is right, but it, um, from what I recall, every project had um, a $1,000 gift or higher. Um, so there were certainly people that just kind of stood up and said, wow, this, this is exactly what I want to give to you. Um, here's a thousand dollar gift. Um, we also had folks, um, you know, so with crowdfunding, what I didn't show was that we, we label things as different impact items. So um, for some of the campaigns, people really wanted to give the larger gift because they saw what a big impact it would have versus the smaller, the smaller dollar amount gift. Um, and you know, every project was so different that um, some of them I think did skew higher. Um, the LGBTQ Leadership Academy had some really large impact items on the page, which I think drove larger gifts. 
Um, the Baja team, you know, they were asking for nuts and bolts for $10. And um, that's a great way to just kind of bring people into the fold and, um, you know, not, not ask for a whole lot. Um, but, um, but I, I was surprised myself um, the amount of hundred dollar, two hundred and fifty dollar, um, and then the large gifts at, at each campaign. Um, so um, certainly the small gifts were welcome, but um, you know I think that average gift isn't skewed by you know one, one hundred thousand dollar gift or one you know one uh, twenty thousand dollar gift. Um, uh, it, and I think you can see in the results slide if you go back one more. Um, you can see the number of donors there too. Um, so it should give you a sense of what they were putting forward. Awesome. So I see that it's the top of the hour. We're going to keep going through all the questions that have come in, but I don't want to forget to remind you all to fill out the exit survey once you log out of this webinar. Uh, we are in the midst of planning the rest of our 2014 lineup, and your input is particularly appreciated because of that. Um, plus, by filling out the exit survey, you're entered into the drawing to receive a copy of our book, Social Works. Uh, before we dive right back into questions, Daniela, I know you've been uh, chatting with some folks on Twitter. Do you have a couple of favorite tweets that you'd like to share? Um, I just want to say, Chris Landry, whoever you are, if you ever need a job, you can come hang out with me over here at Skidmore <laughs> because he's killing it on Twitter. Um, my favorite one that he had um, was an idea to create Skids memes with things or sayings that might engage current students and young alumni more, so you better believe awesome. that will be part of our promotional material next year. So thank you, Chris, for the wonderful idea. That is my favorite tweet to date, I think. <laughs> <laughs> to date. And Ashley, I know this is a tough question because you've been presenting, but were there any favorite tweets that you've had or should I come back to you? Um, I did a favorite one, but um, it was one of uh, one for Skidmore. Um, <laughs> a question, a question um, did you put um, the Skid photos on a Pinterest board? Yes, that's a great question. I think that was from our friend um, who um, Mallory Sheila, mentioned before, right. and now the name is escaping me. Um, but no, Sheila. we didn't. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I told her that that's going to be the first thing I do when I get off this webinar now, is to create a Pinterest board with the skids on the loose images. So yeah, it was a great idea. Awesome. So we've got uh, some questions here, and I need to regain control of my mouse. So in order to do that, my apologies, I've got to exit out of this webinar just for a second. Um, let's see. Uh, Daniela, how many people worked on the campaign? Huh. Um, the first year, it was me and my wonderful colleague who created the infographic and also gave me the numbers during the webinar, Jess Cellini. So it was just us two. Um, this year, we brought, of course, that was with buy-in from higher-ups and, and all the um, support that we needed to go through with everything. This year, we added on um, a great, one of my great, advancement social media interns who did a lot of the organizing on the back channel and curating of the photos to help. Um, but it was just basically us two and um, support whenever we needed it for stuff. So two, two and a half, I would say, folks. <laughs> Is anyone else having trouble hearing Mallory? Oh, yes, sorry I was going to say, is that, that. oh. <laughs> oh, my bad. I was on mute. Um, <laughs> so the question, uh, Daniela, the next question is um, permission to use the photos that were submitted. I know that you talked a little bit about that, but if you don't mind uh, addressing it just quickly again, that'd be great. Yes. Um, so we, we sort of covered ourselves in our um, – Profile um, write up. We have a description that says, you know, um, if you use the hashtag Skidmore, we can um, we can use we might 
re regram them or retag them depending on what it um, what platform that you're on and then outside of the like, general use I mean it's a photo challenge and a photo campaign so people sort of know that if you're submitting a photo that we will use them and um, and sort of repurpose them um, you can ask first it's always a good thing but you can sort of cover yourself too by adding in that language oh no did we lose her again? No. I'm oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Ashley, a few questions for you. Uh, what percentage of the donors were alumni versus just friends of the college? It really varied for each campaign. We found that the campaigns that had an academic focus, so the LGBTQ Leadership Academy, the uh, Latino Studies Program who had campaigns, um, had significantly higher percentage of alumni participation, um, upwards of 80%. Um, some of the engineering team projects um, reached far beyond Cornell friends and family uh, and into the, you know, the new friend donors. And I expect that's because they had a lot of um, the students kind of reaching out to anyone who might be interested in um, the work that they were doing. and. Um, I think the average across all campaigns was, um, I think it was 63% alumni participation. Um, but that was something that we were really happy with, that number. And a few questions, actually, around um, the vendor that you used. So remind us who the vendor was and what was the back end payment and processing like for the crowd? Okay, yeah. That's a good question. Um, so the vendor that we used for the first phase of the pilot um, is USEED, U-S-E-E-D, and you can find that first pilot online at cornell.useed.net. Um, the um, payment piece was integrated with our own payment system. We use a PayPal Pro at Cornell. Um, but what I found, um, looking, we're, we're not going to use that vendor in our second phase. We're going to use a different vendor. Um, but what I found, you know, from vendor to vendor, <laughs> as we've been looking at different platforms, is that um, it's, it's pretty easy just to set up a page and plug in your own giving widget that you probably already have multiple places on your own website. Um, so don't be so concerned with that. Um, you want you certainly want the gifts coming directly back to you and being put in your system with the, um, all of the things that you need to do to track the gifts and make sure they get to the right fund. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to reinvent the wheel and come up with a new gift processing, um, new gift processing functionality, um, and rather to ask your vendor to skin the page that um, they're, they're going to use and people click give to include your own um, payment portal. And um, you know maybe ask them to brand it, to make sure it, it represents the rest of the crowdfunding pages that you have. Were people able to donate through their mobile devices? Yes. Okay. And um, someone asked, uh, were all the projects? Um, and I'll go back to that slide. Were all of these projects in the pilot new fundraising opportunities or were they um, opportunities that someone could have already been giving to? Um, these were all new niche opportunities, um, especially for alumni affairs to be involved with. Um, some of them, like I said, were things that were on our radar for larger projects that we, we kind of carved um, a, a smaller $10,000 or $15,000 goal out of um, where the rest of the funds were going to be raised um, elsewhere within the division. Um, so some of the priorities were already on our radar. Um, there's also the engineering team projects at Cornell who have to fundraise every year, um, and they have that as part of their ongoing um, you know, uh, participation in being a project team. Um, so that wasn't necessarily new, but we made giving to their project easier by providing this platform to them and mm -hmm. the kind of structure and coaching around it. What was the turnaround time like for the university to process and deliver the actual donated dollars to those projects? 
Um, it was near real time because um, we designated a unique project code, so we knew that when the gifts were given, they were given through crowdfunding um, and direct and put that directly into the project fund. So everyone that we worked with already had a fund established, um, and we would just you know make sure the resources were allocated that way. The only thing that didn't get counted right away was um, corporate matching. So we didn't count that in the kind of live total on the website. Um, corporate matching would just be kind of an added bonus for folks whenever that process <laughs> happened. And it really depends on um, the, the um, corporate employers that are matching the gifts and when they get around to submitting those. Um, so that's why we didn't count that as live, but we did make it an option just like we would any kind of standard gift to Cornell. Um, if mm -hmm. you wanted to have your company match that, um, you can, and it can go directly to this project too. And so Chris on, on Twitter is asking if there was any pushback from potential donors about crowdfunding, like uh, you know we've seen with Kickstarter campaigns by celebrities. Um, yeah, and I'm seeing that. I think that's an example. School doesn't have the money. Um, so I think um, there is still the stigma that, you know, it's big Ivy League institutions like Cornell have all this money, and you know, why are they asking for money? They have all the money in the world. Um, and I think um, we can be more transparent in our storytelling through things like crowdfunding to kind of highlight the places where there are real needs. And um, we just don't have the money to service all of it. Um, we didn't see any pushback. It, you know, instead um, we had some major gift donors um, chime in and actually really enjoy um, having the opportunity to give in this way. Um, the large project that we had, the $30,000 project for Agua Clara, um, in the first week we had uh, a major gift prospect. Um, chime in and say, I've been trying to get people involved in Agua Clara uh, for so long. I'm so glad that, you know, you're highlighting this now. I'm not going to let this project fail, <laughs> which was really nice mm -hmm. going into a, a, a $30,000 project that we knew that we would have someone kind of swoop in at the end um, if we weren't going to reach the goal. Um, but um, he was really empowered because he knew crowdfunding would bring um, more people into the cause that um, he was really passionate about. So um, I think we saw the opposite of pushback from the donors. If anything, it was mm -hmm. more sensitivity internally about um, not to step on people's toes and make sure to keep everyone happy. And you know, um, labeling this a pilot um, was the best way to kind of <laughs> ease those tensions internally um, um, to let people know that we're you know, we're just trying this, this is just a test, this is not a new way of business, um, we're just trying to prove that it does or doesn't work. And one more question for you, Ashley. Um, this also came from Twitter. Does your team within the Cornell Alumni Giving Office do any sort of coordination with those who are running social media and other divisions at Cornell and particularly um, admissions or maybe the central branding marketing office? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, um, Cornell Admissions doesn't do a lot on social media. Um, right now it's um, pretty decentralized at Cornell um, across the university, um, but specifically within admissions. Um, we always look for opportunities to partner with other groups on campus, um, and we do let our central communications office know what we're up to so that if it's something that they feel would be beneficial to the larger audience um, that they could share it out. Um, but, um, you know, for this pilot in particular, our goals really were in line with um, our direct audience being alumni, family, and friends. So um, we didn't reach out too much um, across silos for, for this, um, aside for, you know, engaging the current students and engaging um, the faculty and staff members that we wouldn't already be talking to. I think that was really nice. Um, we're kind of expanding the alumni affairs network in that way um, and making some really great relationships that we wouldn't have an opportunity to make otherwise. Awesome. And Danielle, one more question for you before we wrap this webinar up. 
uh, I believe this came from Twitter as well. Did you find any difference in engagement with those submitted photos from social media versus those sub who submitted photos from email? Um, a little, I guess, would probably be the way to answer that. Um, the ones that were submitted via social from the user uh, were shared a lot more, um, but the ones that came in via email often had a story attached to them. So, um, so it was a different level of engagement, I would say, if we were looking for share and reach, then. Um, and I think Ashley mentioned this too, you know, social media works better when it comes from the user and not the institution in some cases. Um, but we did get fun little stories and shared nuggets um, with the pictures.